Good evening, and welcome to Victorian Story Hour. I am your host, the Storyteller, and this is the Archives, where I seek to preserve and celebrate tales from around the world. Tonight, we have a selection of sonnets by Shakespeare, another tale from the Empire of Japan, poems by Edgar Allan Poe, more from the Jungle Book by Kipling, and finally, a reading from the diary of Samuel Pepys. Let us begin, shall we? Now with Shakespeare, we had left off at Sonnet 7. We have been encountering a theme about preserving one's beauty and about withholding it from a loved one. I have a feeling we shall see more of that. So, Sonnet 7. Lo, in the Orient, when the gracious light lifts up his burning head, each under eye, doth homage to his new appearing sight, serving with looks his sacred majesty, and having climbed the steep up heavenly hill, resembling strong youth in his middle age, yet mortal looks adore his beauty still, attending on his golden pilgrimage. But when from highmost pitch with weary ear, like feeble age he reeleth from the day, the eyes for duetous now converted are from his low tract and look another way. So thou thyself outgoing in thy noon, unlookst on diest unless thou get a son. Different imagery, but a similar theme as we have seen, this sense of continuation through one's progeny, of beauty wasted and withheld, of beauty waning over age. Though I do rather like the imagery of the sun as opposed to some of the other m motifs he's used so far, let us see now what Sonnet 8 has in store. Music to hear, why hearst thou music sadly? Sweets with sweets war not, joy delights in joy. Why lovest thou that which thou receivest not gladly, or else receivest with pleasure thine annoy? If the true concord of well-tuned sounds, by unions married, do offend thine ear, they do but sweetly chide thee, who confounds in singleness the parts that thou shouldst bear. Mark how one string, sweet husband to another, strikes each in each by mutual ordering, resembling sire and child and happy mother, who all in one, one pleasing note do sing, whose speechless song being many, seeming one, sings this to thee, thou singled wilt prove none. Mm. Another beautiful image of the harmony of family, of marriage and children and life together, set up against this idea, this selfishness that we see of withholding beauty, of withholding love, of refusing family. Mm. More of that to come. But now we turn to Japan. And to this week's tale, the story of Susa, the impetuous. When Izanagi, the lord who invites, turned his back upon the unclean place and bade farewell to Yomi, the world of the dead, whither he had journeyed upon a quest, he beheld once more the land of fresh rice ears and was glad. And he rested by the side of a clear river that he might perform purification. And Izinagi no Mikoto bathed in the upper reach, but he said, the water of the upper reach is too rapid. Then he bathed in the lower reach, but he said, the water of the lower reach is too sluggish. So he went down for the third time and bathed in the middle reach of the river. And as the water dropped from his beautiful countenance, there were created three sublime deities, Amaterasu, the glory of high heaven, Suki Yomi no Kami, the moon knight possessor, and Susa, the impetuous, the 
the Lord of the sea. Then Izanagi no Mikoto rejoiced, saying, Behold, the three august children that are mine, who shall also be illustrious forever. And taking the great string of jewels from his neck, he bestowed it upon Amaterasu, the glorious, and said to her, Do thine augustness rule the plain of high heaven, shining in thy beauty by day. So she took the august jewels and hid them in the storehouse of the gods. And the Lord of Invitation commanded Suki Yomi no Kami, saying, Do thine augustness rule the dominion of the night. Now this was a youth of a fair and pleasant countenance, and to the youngest of the deities, his augustness the Lord Izanagi gave the sea plain. So Amaterasu ruled the day, and Suki Yomi no Kami softly ruled the night. But Susa, the impetuous, flung himself upon the ground and violently wept, for he said, Ah, oh, miserable to dwell forever upon the confines of the cold sea. So he ceased not in his weeping, and took the moisture of the valley for his tears, so that the green places were withered up, and the rivers and streams were dried up. And evil deities increased and flourished, and as they swarmed upon the earth, their noise was as the noise of flies in the fifth moon, and far and wide there arose portents of woe. Then his father, the Lord of Invitation, came and stood terribly by him and said, What is this that I do see and hear? Why dost thou not rule the dominions with which I charge thee, but lie here? like a child with tears and wailings, answer. And Susa the impetuous answered, I wail because I am in misery and love not this place, but would depart to my mother who rules the nether distant land, who is called the Queen of Yomi, the world of the dead. Then Izanagi was wroth and expelled him with a divine expulsion and charged him that he should depart and show his face no more. And Susa, the impetuous, answered, So be it. But first I will ascend to high heaven to take leave of her augustness, my sister, who is the glory of heaven, and then I will depart. So he went up to heaven, and with a noise and a great speed, and at his going all the mountains shook, and every land and country quaked. And Amaterasu, the light of heaven, she also trembled at his coming, and said, This coming of his augustness, my brother, is of no good intent but to lay hold of mine inheritance and to take it by force. For this alone does he invade the fastness of high heaven. And forthwith she divided the hair that hung upon her shoulders and rolled it in two august bunches to the left and to the right and adorned it with jewels. So she made her head like the head of a young warrior. And she slung upon her back a great bow and a quiver of arrows, one thousand and five hundred arrows. And she took in her hand a bamboo staff and brandished it and stamped upon the ground with her armed feet so that the earth flew like powdered snow. So she came to the bank of the tranquil river of heaven and stood valiantly like unto a mighty man and waited. And Susa, the impetuous, spoke from the farther bank. My lovely sister, thine augustness, why comest thou thus armed against me? And she answered, Nay, but wherefore ascendest thou hither? And Susa replied, There is nothing evil in my mind, because I desired to dwell in the land of Yomi. Therefore has my father deigned to expel me with a divine expulsion, and I thought to take leave of thee, and so I have ascended hither. I have no evil intention. And she, bending her great eyes on him, said, Swear. And he swore by the ten grasp sword that was girded on him, and after that he swore by the jewels in her hair. Then she suffered him to cross over the tranquil river of heaven, and also to cross over the floating bridge. So Susa, the impetuous, entered the dominions of his sister, the sun goddess. But his wild spirit never ceased to chafe. And he pillaged the fair lands of Amaterasu and broke down the divisions of the rice fields which she had planted and filled in the ditches. Still, the light of heaven upbraided him not.
but said, His Augustness, my brother, believes that the land should not be wasted by ditches and divisions, and that rice should be sown everywhere without distinction. But notwithstanding her soft words, Susa the impetuous continued in his evil ways and became more and more violent. Now, as the great sun goddess sat with her maidens in the awful weaving hall of high heaven, seeing to the weaving of the august garments of the gods, her brother made a mighty chasm in the roof of the weaving hall, and through the chasm he let down a heavenly piebald horse. And the horse fled hither and thither in terror, and wrought great havoc among the looms and amongst the weaving maidens. And Susa himself followed like a rushing tempest, and like a storm of waters flooding the hall, and all was confusion and horror. And in the press the sun goddess was wounded with her golden shuttle. So with a cry she fled from high heaven and hid herself in a cave, and she rolled a rock across the cave's mouth. Then dark was the plain of high heaven, and black dark the central land of reed plains, and eternal night prevailed. Hereupon the voices of the deities, as they wandered over the face of the earth, were like unto the flies in the fifth moon, and from far and near there arose portents of woe. Therefore did the eight hundred myriad deities assemble, with a divine assembly in the dry bed of the tranquil river of heaven there to hold parley and to make decision what should be done. And his Augustness, the Lord of Deep Thoughts, commanded them. So they called together the singing birds of eternal night, and they charged Amasumara, the divine smith, to make them a mirror of shining white metal. And they charged Tamanoya no Mikoto to string together many hundreds of curved jewels. And having performed divination by the shoulder blade of a stag of Mount Kagu, they uprooted a sacred tree, a sakaki, of five hundred branches. And they hung the jewels upon the branches of the tree, and they hung the mirror upon its branches. And all the lower branches they covered with offerings, streamers of white and streamers of blue, and they bore the tree before the rock cavern where the sun goddess was. And immediately the assembled birds sang. Then a divine maiden of fair renown, who for grace and skill in dancing had no sister, either in the land of rice ears or upon the plain of high heaven, stood before the cavern door. And there was hung about her for a garland the club moss from Mount Kagu, and her head was bound with the leaves of the spindle tree, and with flowers of gold and flowers of silver, and a sheaf of green bamboo grass was in her hands. And she danced before the cavern door as one possessed. For heaven and earth have not seen the like of her dancing. It was more lovely than the pine tops waving in the wind or the floating of sea foam. And the cloud race upon the plain of high heaven is not to be compared with it. And the earth quaked and high heaven shook and all the 800 myriad deities laughed together. Now Amaterasu, the glory of heaven, lay in the rock cavern, and the bright light streamed from her fair body in rays, so that she was as a great jewel of price. And pools of water gleamed in the floor of the cavern, and the slime upon the walls gleamed with many colors, and the small rock plants flourished in the unwanted heat, so that the heavenly lady lay in a bower and slept. And she awoke because of the song of the eternal singing birds. And she raised herself and flung the hair back over her shoulders and said, Alack, the poor birds that sing in the long night. And there came to her the sound of dancing and of high revel and of the merriment of the gods. So she was still and listened. And presently she felt the plain of high heaven shake and heard the 800 myriad deities as they laughed together. And she arose and came to the door of the cavern and rolled back the great stone a little way. And a beam of light fell upon the dancing maiden where she stood panting in all her array. But the other deities were yet in darkness, and they looked at each other and were still. Then spoke the fair glory of heaven. Methought that because I was hidden, the plain of high heaven should be dark, 
and black dark the central land of reed plains. How then doth the dancing maiden go thus, adorned with garlands, and her head tired? And why do the eight hundred myriad deities laugh together? Then the dancing maiden made answer, O oh, thine augustness, that art the sweet delight of all the deities. Behold, the divine maidens are decked with flowers, and the gods assemble with shouts. We rejoice, and are glad because there is a goddess more illustrious than thine augustness. And Amaterasu heard, and was wroth. And she covered her face with her long sleeves, so that the deity should not see her tears. Howbeit they fell like the falling stars. Then the youths of the court of heaven stood by the Sakaki tree, where hung the mirror that made by Amasumara, the divine smith. And they cried, Lady, look, and behold the new paragon of heaven. And Amaterasu said, Indeed, I will not behold. Nevertheless, she presently let slip the sleeves that covered her countenance and looked in the mirror. And as she looked and beheld and was dazzled by her own beauty that was without peer, she came forth slowly from the rocks of the cavern. And the light of her flooded high heaven and below the rice ears waved and shook themselves and the wild cherry rushed into flower. And all the deities joined their hands in a ring about Amaterasu, the goddess of the sun, and the door of the rock cavern was shut. Then the dancing maiden cried, O lady, thine augustness, how should any deity be born to compare with thee the glory of heaven? So with joy they bore the goddess to her place. But Susa, the swift, the brave, the impetuous, the long-haired, and the thrice unhappy, the lord of the sea, he, the deities, arraigned to stand trial in the dry bed of the tranquil river of heaven. And they took counsel, and fined him with a great fine. And having shorn him of his hair, which was his beauty and his pride, for it was blue black as an iris, and hung below his knee, they banished him for ever from the heavenly precincts. So Susa descended to earth by the floating bridge, with bitterness in his heart, and for many days he wandered in despair, he knew not whither. By fair rice fields he came, and by barren moors, heeding nothing, and at last he stayed to rest by the side of the river called Hai, which is in the land of Izumo. And as he sat moody, his head on his hand, and looked down at the water, he beheld a chopstick floating on the surface of the stream. So Susa, the impetuous, arose immediately, saying, There are people at the river head and he pursued his way up the bank in quest of them. And when he had gone not a great way, he found an old man weeping and lamenting very grievously among the reeds and willows by the waterside. And there was with him a lady of great state and beauty, like unto the daughter of a deity, but her fair eyes were marred with many tears, and she moaned continually and wrung her hands. And these twain had between them a young maid of very slender and delicate form. But her face Susa could not see, for she covered it with a veil. And ever and anon she moved and trembled with fear, and seemed to beseech the old man earnestly, or plucked the lady by the sleeve, at which these last but shook their heads sorrowfully, and returned to their lamentations. And Susa, full of wonder, drew near and asked the old man, who art thou? And the old man answered, I am an earthly deity of the mountains. This is my wife, who weeps with me by the water side, and the child is my youngest daughter. And Susa inquired of him again, What is the cause of your weeping and lamentation? And he answered, Know, sir, that I am an earthly deity of renown, and I was the father of eight fair daughters. But a horror broods over the land, for every year at this time it is ravaged by a monster, the eight-forked serpent of Kashi, that delights in the flesh of young virgins. 
In seven years have my seven sweet children been devoured, and now the time of my youngest born is at hand. Therefore do we weep, O thine augustness. Then Susa, the impetuous, What is the likeness of this monster? And the deities of the mountain made answer, His eyes are fiery and red as the Akagagachi, that is, the winter cherry. He has but one body with eight heads and eight scaly tails. Moreover, on his body grows moss, together with the fir and the cryptomeria of the forest. In his going, he covers eight valleys and eight hills, and upon his underside he is red and gory. Then the Lord Susa the impetuous cried, My Lord, give me thy daughter. And the earthly deity, seeing his strength and great beauty and the brightness of his countenance, knew that he was a god, and answered, With all reverence do I offer her unto thee, howbeit I know not thine august name. And Susa said, I am Susa, the sea god, the exile of high heaven. And the mountain deity, and also his fair wife, spoke, saying, So be it, thine augustness, take the young maid. And immediately Susa flung away the veil and saw the face of his bride, pale as the moon in winter. And he touched her on the forehead and said, Fair and beloved, fair and beloved. And the maid flushed faintly to, to stand thus barefaced. Howbeit, she had little need, for the tears that stood in, more lo in my lord Seuss's eyes were veil enough for her modesty. And he said again, Dear and beautiful, our pleasure shall be hereafter, now we may not tarry. So he took the young maid at once, and changed her into a crown for his head. And Susa wore the crown gallantly. And he instructed the, earth de the earthly deity, and together they brewed sake, refined eightfold, and with the sake they filled eight vats and set them in readiness. And when all was prepared, they waited. And presently there was a mighty noise like the sound of an earthquake, and the hills and valleys shook, and the serpent crawled in sight huge and horrible, so that the earthly deities hid their faces for fear. But Susa the impetuous gazed upon the serpent with his sword drawn. Now the serpent had eight heads, and immediately he dipped a head into each vat of sake and drank long. Thereupon he became drunk with the distilled liquor, and all the heads lay down and slept. Then the Lord Susa brandished his ten grasp sword and leapt upon the monster and cut off the eight heads with eight valiant strokes. So the serpent was slain with a great slaying, and the river high flowed on a river of blood. And Susa cut the tails of the serpent also, and he struck the fourth tail, the edge of his august sword. And as he struck the fourth tail, the edge of his august sword was turned back. So he probed with its point, and found a great jeweled sword, with a blade sharp as no known smith could temper it. And he took the sword, and sent it for an offering to the sun goddess, his august sister. This is the herb-quelling sword. And Susa, the impetuous, built him a palace at the place called Suga, and dwelt there with his bride. And the clouds of heaven hung like a curtain round about the palace. Then the Lord Susa sang this song. Many clouds arise. The manifold fence of the fourth issuing clouds makes a manifold fence for the spouse to be within. Oh, the manifold fence. Well, impetuous certainly seems to be the right uh, name for Susa. Violent, uh, he, he had a great many wonderful titles in there as well. Uh, <laughs> certainly part of a larger story cycle. We shall hear more of Amaterasu and the others as well. I'd like to think perhaps he learned a lesson in there somewhere. Uh, but his impetuousness and violence does seem to have proven useful. So, we shall leave him there. And now we shall turn our eyes to Master Poe. And a pair of...
poems. The first, a dream within a dream. Take this kiss upon the brow, and in parting from you now, this much let me avow. You are not wrong who deem that my days have been a dream, yet if hope has flown away in a night or in a day, in a vision or in none, is it therefore the less gone? All that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. I stand amid the roar of a surf-tormented shore, and I hold within my hands grains of the golden sand. How few! Yet how they creep through my fingers to the deep, while I weep, while I weep! O oh God, can I not grasp them with a tighter clasp? O oh God, can I not save one from the pitiless wave? Is all that we see or seem but a dream? Within a dream? Mm. <laughs> Certainly we see much of dream imagery from Poe uh, through many of the poems, and this one seems to go a bit deeper as well. His lamentation certainly is stronger in this than some of the other works we have read. His desire to hold on, to maintain that dream. Mm difficult, certainly. And now, uh, not to uh, step away from a theme, we shall now read The Sleeper. At midnight in the month of June, I stand beneath the mystic moon, an opiate vapor, dewy, dim, exhales from out her golden rim, and softly dripping drop by drop upon the quiet mountain top steals drowsily and musically into the universal valley. The rosemary nods upon the grave, the lily lolls upon the wave, wrapping the fog about its breast, the ruin molders into rest. Looking like Lethe, see the lake, a conscious slumber teems to take, and would not for the world awake. All beauty sleeps, and lo, where lies her casement opened to the skies, Irene with her destinies. O oh, lady bright, can it be right? This window open to the night? The wanton airs from the treetop Laughingly through the lattice drop. The bodiless airs a wizard rout Flit through thy chamber in and out And wave the curtain canopy So fitfully, so fearfully, Above the closed and fringed lid Neath which thy slumbering soul lies hid, That o'er the floor and down the wall, Like ghosts, the shadows rise and fall. O lady dear, hast thou no fear? Why, and what art thou dreaming here? Sure thou art come o'er far-off seas, A wonder to these garden trees. Strange is thy pallor, strange thy dress, Strange above all thy length of tress and this all-solemn silentness. The lady sleeps, O oh, may her sleep which is enduring so be deep. Heaven have her in its sacred keep. This chamber changed from one more holy, this bed for one more melancholy. I pray to God that she may lie forever with unopened eye while the dim-sheeted ghosts go by. My love, she sleeps, O oh, may her sleep as it is lasting, so be deep. Soft may the worms about her creep. Far in the forest, dim and old, For her may some tall vault unfold, Some vault that oft hath flung its black, And winged panels fluttering back, Triumphant o'er the crested palls Of her grand family funerals, Some sepulchre remote, alone, against whose portal she hath thrown in childhood many an idle stone, some tomb from out whose sounding door she ne'er shall force an echo more, thrilling to think, poor child of sin, it was the dead who groaned within. Mm. Certainly not an uncommon theme, sleep and death being aligned. We see it in Shakespeare, in Hamlet, uh, and many other works. But here, 
Poe certainly takes it to a <laughs> an extreme of sorts. And the beauty of it, which a hallmark of his Gothic poetry, to see beauty in uh, things that would otherwise be considered darkness, especially as he speaks about the worms and the act of decomposition and there being beauty in that is certainly very Poe. <laughs> More from Master Poe later. But now we shall move on to the Jungle Book, where we shall finish the second half of Mowgli's Brothers. In the first half, we see how Mowgli is found, escapes death by Shere Khan, and is rescued by the wolves and welcomed into the pack at the recommendation of Baloo, who trains the wolves, and Bagheera, the panther who buys his way in with a freshly killed ox. And so now we pick up the story again some ten years later. Now you must be content to skip ten or eleven years whole and only guess at all the wonderful life that Mowgli led among the wolves. Because if it were written out, it would fill ever so many books. He grew up with the cubs, though they of course were grown wolves almost before he was a child, and Father Wolf taught him his business and the meaning of things in the jungle, till every rustle in the grass, every breath of the warm night air, every note of the owls above his head, every scratch of a bat's claws as it roosted for a while in a tree, and every splash of every little fish jumping in a pool meant just as much to him as the work of his office means to a businessman. When he was not learning, he sat out in the sun and slept, and ate, and went to sleep again. When he felt dirty or hot, he swam in the forest pools. And when he wanted honey, Baloo told him that honey and nuts were just as pleasant to eat as raw meat, he climbed up for it, and that Bagheera showed him how to do. Bagheera would lie out on a branch and call, Come along, little brother. And at first, Mowgli would cling like the sloth, but afterwards he would fling himself through the branches almost as boldly as the gray ape. He took his place at the Council Rock, too, when the pack met, and there he discovered that if he stared hard at any wolf, the wolf would be forced to drop his eyes, and so he used to stare for fun. At other times he would pick the long thorns out of the pads of his friends, for wolves suffer terribly from thorns and burrs in their coats. He would go down the hillside into the cultivated lands by night and look very curiously at the villagers in their huts. But he had a mistrust of men because Bagheera showed him a square box with a drop gate so cunningly hidden in the jungle that he nearly walked into it and told him it was a trap. He loved better than anything else to go with Bagheera into the dark, warm heart of the forest to sleep all through the drowsy day and at night See how Bagheera did his killing. Bagheera killed right and left as he felt hungry, and so did Mowgli, with one exception. As soon as he was old enough to understand things, Bagheera told him that he must never touch cattle, because he had been bought into the pack at the price of a bull's life. All the jungle is thine, said Bagheera, and thou canst kill everything that thou art strong enough to kill. But for the sake of the bull that bought thee, thou must never kill or eat any cattle, young or old. That is the law of the jungle. Mowgli obeyed faithfully. And he grew, and grew strong as a boy must grow, who does not know that he is learning any lessons, and who has nothing in the world to think of except things to eat. Mother Wolf told him once or twice that Shere Khan was not a creature to be trusted, and that some day he must kill Shere Khan. But, though a young wolf would have remembered that advice every hour, Mowgli forgot it, because he was only a boy, though he would have called himself a wolf if he had been able to speak in any human tongue. Shere Khan was always crossing his path in the jungle, for as Akela grew older and feebler, the lame tiger had come to be great friends with the younger wolves of the pack, who followed him for scraps, a thing Akela would never have allowed if he had dared to push his authority to the proper bounds. Then Shere Khan would flatter them and wonder that such fine young hunters 
were content to be led by a dying wolf and a man's cub. They tell me, Shere Khan would say, that at council ye dare not look him between the eyes. And the young wolves would growl and bristle. <laughs> Bagheera, who had eyes and ears everywhere, knew something of this, and once or twice he told Mowgli in so many words that Shere Khan would kill him some day. And Mowgli would laugh and answer, I have the pack, and I have thee, and Baloo, though he is so lazy, might strike a blow or two for my sake. Why should I be afraid? It was one very warm day that a new notion came to Bagheera, born of something that he had heard. Perhaps Iki, the porcupine, had told him, but he said to Mowgli when they were deep in the jungle, as the boy lay with his head on Bagheera's beautiful black skin, Little brother, how often have I told thee that Shere Khan is thy enemy? As many times as there are nuts on that palm, said Mowgli, who naturally could not count. What of it? I am sleepy, Bagheera, and Shere Khan is all long tail and loud talk, like Mao, the peacock. But this is no time for sleeping. Baloo knows it, I know it, the pack know it, and even the foolish, foolish deer know it. Tabaki has told thee too. Ho ho, said Mowgli. Tabaki came to me not long ago with some rude talk that I was a naked man's cub and not fit to dig pig nuts. But I caught Tabaki by the tail and swung him twice against a palm tree to teach him better manners. Mm. That was foolishness. For though Tabaki is a mischief maker, he would have told thee of something that concerned thee closely. Open those eyes, little brother. Shere Khan dares not kill thee in the jungle for fear of those that love thee. But remember, Akela is very old, and soon the day comes when he cannot kill his buck. And then he will be leader no more. Many of the wolves that looked thee over when thou wast brought to the council first are old too. The young wolves believe, as Shere Khan has taught them, that a man, club, man cub has no place with the pack. In a time, thou wilt be a man. And what is a man that he should not run with his brothers? said Mowgli. I was born in the jungle, I have obeyed the law of the jungle, and there is no wolf of ours from whose paws I have not pulled a thorn. Surely they are my brothers. Bagheera stretched himself at full length and half shut his eyes. Little brother, said he, feel under my jaw. Mowgli put up his strong brown hand and just under Bagheera's silky chin, where the giant rolling muscles were all hid by the glossy hair, he came upon a little bald spot. There is no one in the jungle that knows that I, Bagheera, carry that mark, the mark of the collar. And yet, little brother, I was born among men, and it was among men that my mother died in the cages of the king's palace at Odipur. It was because of this that I paid the price for thee at the council when thou was a little naked cub. Yes, I too was born among men. I had never seen the jungle. They fed me behind bars from an iron pan, till one night I felt that I was Bagheera the panther, and no man's plaything, and I broke the silly lock with one blow of my paw, and came away. And because I had learned the ways of men, I became more terrible in the jungle than Shere Khan. Is it not so? Yes, said Mowgli. All the jungle fears Bagheera, all except Mowgli. <laughs> oh, thou art a man's cub, said the black panther, very tenderly. And even as I returned to my jungle, so thou must go back to men at last, to the men who are thy brothers, if thou art not killed in the council. But why, why should any wish to kill me? said Mowgli. Look at me, said Bagheera. And Mowgli looked at him steadily between the eyes. The big panther turned his head away in half a minute. That is why, he said, shifting his paw on the leaves. Not even I can look thee between the eyes, and I was born among men, and I love thee, little brother. 
The others, they hate thee, because their eyes cannot meet thine, because thou art wise, because thou hast pulled out thorns from their feet, because thou art a man. I did not know these things, said Mowgli sullenly, and, his, and he frowned under his heavy black eyebrows. What is the law of the jungle? Strike first and then give tongue. But thy very carelessness, they know that thou art a man. <clears throat> what is the law of the jungle? Strike first and, they, and then give no tongue. And then give tongue. By thy very carelessness, they know that thou art a man. But be wise. It is in my heart that when Akela misses his next kill, and at each hunt it costs him more to pin the buck. The pack will turn against him and against thee. They will hold a jungle council at the rock, and then, and then. I have it, said Bagheera, leaping up. Go thou down quickly to the men's huts in the valley, and take some of the red flower which they grow there, so that when the time comes thou mayest have even a stronger friend than I, or Baloo, or those of the pack that love thee. Get the red flower. By red flower, Bagheera meant fire. Only no creature in the jungle will call fire by its proper name. Every beast lives in deadly fear of it, and invents a hundred ways of describing it. The red flower, said Mowgli, that grows outside their huts in the twilight. I will get some. There speaks the man's cub, said Bagheera proudly. Remember that it grows in little pots. Get one swiftly and keep it by thee for time of need. Good, said Mowgli. I go. But art thou sure, O oh my Bagheera? He slipped his arm around the splendid neck and looked deep into the big eyes. Art thou sure that all this is Shere Khan's doing? By the broken lock that freed me, I am sure, little brother. Then by the bull that bought me, I will pay Shere Khan full tale for this, and it may be a little over said Mowgli, and he bounded away. That is a man. That is all a man, said Bagheera to himself, lying down again. Oh, Shere Khan, never was a blacker hunting than that frog hunt of thine ten years ago. Mowgli was far and far through the forest, running hard, and his heart was hot in him. He came to the cave as the evening mist rose and drew breath and looked down the valley. The cubs were out, but Mother Wolf at the back of the cave knew by his breathing that something was troubling her frog. "'What is it, son?' she said. "'Some bats chatter of Shere Khan,' he called back. "'I hunt among the ploughed fields tonight,' and he plunged downward through the bushes to the stream at the bottom of the valley. There he checked, for he heard the yell of the pack hunting, heard the bellow of a hunted sambur, and the snort as the buck turned at bay. Then there were wicked, bitter howls for the young wolves. Akela! Akela! Let the lone wolf show his strength. Room for the leader of our pack. Spring, Akela! The lone wolf must have sprung and missed. His hold from Mowgli heard the snap of his teeth, and then a yelp as the samber knocked him over with his forefoot. He did not wait for anything more, but dashed on, and the yells grew fainter, behind him as he ran into the croplands where the villagers lived. Bagheera spoke truth, he panted, as he nestled down in some cattle fodder by the window of a hut. Tomorrow is one day for Akela and for me. <laughs> then he pressed his face close to the window and watched the fire on the hearth. He saw the husbandman's wife get up and feed it in the night with black lumps, and when the morning came and the mists were all white and cold, he saw the man's child pick up a wicker pot, plastered inside with earth, fill it with lumps of red-hot charcoal, put it under his blanket, and go out to tend the cows and the beer. Is that all? said Mowgli. If a cub can do it, there is nothing to fear. So he strode around the corner and met the boy, took the pot from his hand, and disappeared into the mist, while the boy howled with fear. They are very like me, said Mowgli, blowing into the pot, as he had seen the woman do. This thing will die if I do not give it things to eat. And he dropped twigs and dried bark on the red stuff. 
Halfway up the hill, he met Bagheera, with the morning dew shining like moonstones on his coat. Akela has missed, said the panther. They would have killed him last night, but they needed thee also. They were looking for thee on the hill. I was among the plowed lands. I am ready. Look, Mowgli held up the fire pot. Good. Now I have seen men thrust a dry branch into that stuff, and presently the red flower blossomed at the end of it. Art thou not afraid? No. Why should I fear? I remember now, if it is not a dream, how before I was a wolf, I lay beside the red flower, and it was warm and pleasant. All that day, Mowgli sat in the cave, tending his fire pot, and dipping dry branches into it to see how they looked. He found a branch that satisfied him, and in the evening, when Tabaki came to the cave and told him, rudely enough, that he was wanted at the Council Rock, he laughed till Tabaki ran away. Then Mowgli went to the Council, still laughing. Akela the Lone Wolf lay by the side of his rock as a sign that the leadership of the pack was open, and Shere Khan, with his following of scrap-fed wolves, walked to and fro openly, being flattered. Bagheera lay close to Mowgli, and a fire pot was between Mowgli's knees. When they were all gathered together, Shere Khan began to speak, a thing he never would have dared to do when Akela was in his prime. He has no right, whispered Bagheera. Say so. He is a dog's son. He will be frightened. Mowgli sprang to his feet. Free people, he cried. Does Shere Khan lead the pack? What has a tiger to do with our leadership? Seeing that the leadership is yet open, and being asked to speak, Shere Khan began. By whom, said Mowgli, are we all jackals to fawn on this cattle butcher? The leadership of the pack is with the pack alone. There were yells of, Silence, thou man's cub, let him speak. He has kept our law, and at last the seniors of the pack thundered, Let the dread wolf speak. When a leader of the pack has missed his kill, he is called the dead wolf, as long as he lives, which is not long as a rule. Akela raised his old head wearily. Free people, and ye too, jackals of Shere Khan, for twelve seasons I have led ye to and from the kill, and at all that time not one has been trapped or maimed. Now I have missed my kill. Ye know how that plot was made. Ye know how ye brought me up to an untried buck to make my weakness known. It was cleverly done. Your right is to kill me here on the Council Rock now. Therefore, I ask, who comes to make an end of the Lone Wolf? For it is my right, by the law of the jungle, that ye come one by one. There was a long hush for no single wolf cared to fight Akela to the death. Then Shere Khan roared, Bah! What have we to do with this toothless fool? He is doomed to die. It is the man-cub who has lived too long. Free people, he was my meat from the first. Give him to me. I am weary of this man-wolf folly. He has troubled the jungle for ten seasons. Give me the man-cub, or I will hunt here always and not give you one bone. He is a man, a man's child, and from the marrow of my bones I hate him. Then more than half the pack yelled, A man! A man! What has a man to do with us? Let him go to his own place. And turn all the people of the villages against us, snarled Shere Khan. No, give him to me. He is a man, and none of us can look him between the eyes. Akela lifted his head again and said, He has eaten our food. He has slept with us. He has driven game for us. 
he has broken no word of the law of the jungle. Also, I paid for him with a bull when he was accepted. The worth of a bull is little, but Bagheera's honor is something that he will perhaps fight for, said Bagheera in his gentlest voice. A bull paid ten years ago, the pack snarled. What do we care for bones ten years old? Or for a pledge, said Bagheera, his white teeth bared under his lips. Well are ye called the free people. No man's cub can run with the people of the jungle, roared Shere Khan. Give him to me. He is our brother in all but blood, Akela went on. And ye would kill him here. In truth, I have lived too long. Some of ye are eaters of cattle. And of others I have heard that under Shere Khan's teaching you go by dark night and snatch children from the village's doorstep. Therefore I know ye to be cowards, and it is to cowards I speak. It is certain that I must die, and my life is of no worth, or I would offer that in the man-cub's place. But for the sake of the honor of the pack, a little matter that, by being without a leader, ye have forgotten. I promise that if ye let the man-cub go to his own place, I will not, when my time comes to die, bear one tooth against ye. I will die without fighting. That will at least save the pack three lives. More I cannot do, but if ye will, I can save ye the shame that comes of killing a brother against whom there is no fault. A brother spoken for and bought into the pack according to the law of the jungle. He is a man, a man, a man, snarled the pack, and most of the wolves began to gather round Shere Khan, whose tail was beginning to switch. Now the business is in thy hands, Bagheera to Mowgli. We can do no more except fight. Mowgli stood upright, the fire pot in his hands. Then he stretched out his arms and yawned in the face of the council. But he was furious with rage and sorrow, for wolf-like, the wolves had never told him how they hated him. Listen, you, he cried. There is no need for this dog's jabber. You've told me so often tonight that I am a man, though indeed I would have been a wolf with you to my life's end that I feel your words are true. So I do not call you my brothers any more, but sog, dogs, as a man should. What you will do and what you will not do is not yours to say. That matter is with me, and that we may see the matter more plainly. I, the man, have brought here a little of the red flower which ye dogs fear. He flung the fire pot on the ground, and some of the red coals lit a tuft of dried moss that flared up as all the council drew back in terror before the leaping flames. Mowgli thrust his dead branch into the fire till the twigs lit and crackled and whirled it above his head among the cowering wolves. Thou art the master, said Bagheera in an undertone. Save Akela from the death. He was ever thy friend. Akela, the grim old wolf who had never asked for mercy in his life, gave one piteous look at Mowgli, as the boy stood all naked, his long black hair tossing over his shoulders in the light of the blazing branch that made the shadows jump and quiver. Good, said Mowgli, staring around slowly and thrusting out his lower lip. I see the ER dogs. I go from you to my own people, if they be my own people. The jungle is shut to me, and I must forget your talk and your companionship, but I will be more merciful than ye are, because I was all but your brother in blood. I promise that when I am a man among men, I will not betray you to men as ye have betrayed me. He kicked the fire with his foot, and the sparks flew up. There shall be no war between any of us in the pack, but here is a debt to pay before I go. He strode forward to where Shere Khan sat blinking stupidly at the flames and caught him by the tuft on his chin. Bagheera followed closely in case of accidents. Up, dog! Mowgli cried, up when a man speaks, or I will set that coat ablaze. 
Shere Khan's ears lay flat back on his head, and he shut his eyes, for the blazing branch was very near. This cattle killer said he would kill me in the council, because he had not killed me when I was a cub. Thus and thus, then do we beat dogs when we are men. Stir a whisker, Lungri, and I ram the red flower down thy gullet. He beat Shere Khan over the head with the branch, and the tiger whimpered and whined in an agony of fear. Pa, singe jungle cat, go now. But remember, when next I come to the Council Rock, as a man should come, it will be with Shere Khan's hide on my head. For the rest, Akela goes free to live as he pleases. You will not kill him, because that is not my will. Nor do I think that you will sit here any longer, lolling out your tongues as though you were somebody's, instead of dogs whom I drive out. Thus, go! The fire was burning furiously at the end of the branch, and Mowgli struck right and left round the circle, and the wolves ran howling with the sparks burning their fur. At last there were only Akela, Bagheera, and perhaps ten wolves that had taken Mowgli's part. Then something began to hurt Mowgli inside him, as he had never been hurt in his life before, and he caught his breath and sobbed, and the tears ran down his face. What, what is it? What is it? he said. I do not wish to leave the jungle, and I do not know what this is. Am I dying, Bagheera? No, little brother. Those are only tears such as men use, said Bagheera. Now I know thou art a man and a man's cub no longer. The jungle is shut indeed to thee henceforward. Let them fall, Mowgli. They are only tears. So Mowgli sat and cried as though his heart would break, and he had never cried in all his life before. Now, he said, I will go to men, but first I must say farewell to my mother. And he went to the cave where she lived with Father Wolf, and he cried on her coat while the four cubs howled miserably. He will not forget me, said Mowgli. Never while we can follow a trail, said the cubs. Come to the foot of the hill when thou art a man, and we will talk to thee, and we will come into the croplands to play with thee by night. Come soon, said Father Wolf. O oh, wise little frog, come again soon, for we be old, thy mother and I. Come soon, said Mother Wolf, little naked son of mine, for listen, child of man, I loved, me, I loved thee more than ever I loved my cubs. I will surely come, said Mowgli, and when I come it will be to lay out Shere Khan's hide upon the council rock. Do not forget me. Tell them in the jungle never to forget me. The dawn was beginning to break when Mowgli went down the hillside, alone to the crops, to meet those mysterious things that are called men. Hmm. And so ends the first tale of the Jungle Book. Many more of those to come as well. A boy becomes a wolf, a wolf becomes a man. And a man will hunt a tiger. Now, lastly, reading from Pepys' diary. We are nearing the end of January of 1660. Uh, the government at the time is very unstable. Uh, the parliament has essentially been dissolved. There's a very small number that are allowed to rule. The military is up in arms against it. And there are calls for free elections. It is a time of great unrest. It is following on the heels of the end of Cromwell's protectorate of England, following on the revolution uh, and the beheading of Charles I. It is a deeply unstable time and an uncertain time. And so we pick up. This morning I was sent for to Mr. Downing, and at his bedside he told me that he hath a kindness for me, and that he thought that he hath done me one, and that was that he hath got me to be one of the clerks of the council, at which I was a little stumbled and could not tell what to do, whether to thank him or no, but I by and by did, but not very heartily, for I feared that his doing of it was but only to ease himself of the salary which he gave me. 
After that, Mr. Shepley staying below all this while for me, we went thence and met Mr. Pierce, so at the harp and ball drank our morning draught, and so to Whitehall, where I met with Sir Anthony Cooper, and did give him some answer from my lord, and he did give us leave to keep the lodgings still. And so we did determine thereupon that Mr. Shepley might now go into the country, and would do so to-morrow. Back I went to Mr. Downing's, by Mr. Downing's order, and stayed there till twelve o'clock, in expectation of one to come to read some writings. But he came not. So I stayed, all alone, reading the answer of the Dutch ambassador to our state, in answer to the reasons of my lord's coming home, which he gave for his coming, and did labor herein to contradict my lord's arguments for his coming home. Thence to my office, and so with Mr. Shepley and Moore, to dine upon a turkey with Mrs. Jemima, and after that Mr. Moore and I went to the French Ordinary, where Mr. Downing this day feasted Sir Arthur Hazelrig, and a great many more of the Parliament, and did stay to put him in mind of me. Here he gave me a note to go and invite some other members to dinner to-morrow. So I went to Whitehall, and did stay at Marsh's with Simons, Llewellyn, and all the rest of the clerks of the council, who I hear are all turned out, only the two Lees, and they do all tell me that my name was mentioned the last night, but that nothing was done in it. Hence I went, and did leave some of my notes at the lodgings of the members, and so home. To bed. January the 20th. In the morning I went to Mr. Downing's bedside, and gave him an account of what I had done as to his guests, and I went thence to my lord Widrington, who I met in the street going to seal the patents for the judges to-day, and so could not come to dinner. I called upon Mr. Calthorpe about the money due to my lord. Here I met with Mr. Woodfine, and drank with him at the Sun in Chancery Lane, and so to Westminster Hall, where at the lobby I spoke with the rest of my guests, and so to my office. At noon went by water with Mr. Maylard and Hales to the Swan in Fish Street, at our Collie Feast, where we were very merry at our Joel of Ling. And from thence, after a great and good dinner of fish, Mr. Falconbridge would go drink a cup of ale at a place where I had liked to have shit in a skimmer that lay over the house of office. Thence, calling on Mr. Stevens and Wooten, with whom I drank, uh, about business of my lord's, I went to the coffee club, where there was nothing done but choosing of a committee for orders. Thence to Westminster Hall, where Mrs. Lane and the rest of the maids have their white scarves, all having been at the burial of a young bookseller in the hall. Thence to Mr. Shepley, and took him to my house and drank with him, in order to his going to-morrow. So parted, and I sat up late, making up my accounts before he go. This day... Three citizens of London went to meet Monk from the Common Council. January the 21st. Up early in finishing my accounts and writing to my lord, and from thence to my lord's, and took leave of Mr. Shepley in possession of all the keys and the house. Thence to my office for some money to pay Mr. Shepley, and sent it him by the old man. I then went to Mr. Downing, who chid me because I did not give him notice of some of his guests failed him, but I told him that I sent our porter to tell him, and he was not within. But he told me that he was within till past twelve o'clock. So the porter, or he, lied. Thence to my office, where nothing to do. Then with Mr. Hawley, he and I went to Mr. Cruz and dined there. Thence into London to Mr. Vernon's, and I received my twenty-five pounds due by bill for my trooper's pay. Then back again to Stedman's at the Mitre de Fleet at the Mitre in Fleet Street, in our way calling on Mr. Fage, who told me how the city have some hopes of Monk. Thence to the Mitre, where I drank a pint of wine, the house being in fitting for Bannister to come thither from Paget's. Thence to Mrs. Jemima, and gave her five pounds, so home and left my money, and to Whitehall, where Llewellyn and I drank and talked together hour an hour at Marsh's, and so up to the clerk's room, where poor Mr. Cook, a black man that is like to be put out of his clerk's place, came and railed at me for endeavouring to put him out and get myself in, when I was already in a good condition. But I satisfied him, and after I had writ a letter there to my lord, wherein I gave him an account how this day Lentil took his chair again and resolved a declaration to be brought in on Monday to satisfy the world what they intend to do. So home, 
and to bed. January the 22nd. I went in the morning to Mr. Messam's, where I met with Mr. Thurnbull and sat with him in his pew. A very eloquent sermon about the duty of all to give good example in our lives and conversation, which I fear he himself was most guilty of not doing. After sermon at the door by appointment, my wife met me, and so to my father's to dinner, where we have not been, to my shame, in a fortnight before. After dinner, my father showed me a letter from Mr. Widrington of Christ's College in Cambridge, wherein he doth express very great kindness for my brother, and my father intends that my brother shall go to him. To church in the afternoon, to Mr. Herring, where a lazy, poor sermon, and so home with Mrs. Turner, and sitting with her a while, we went to my father's, where we supped very merry, and so by coach home. This day I began to put on buckles to my shoes, which I bought yesterday of Mr. Wooten. And there we shall leave Master Peeps. Ah, a good read all around, I should say and many more to come. Thank you for joining and enjoying, I hope, this hour of Victorian stories. We shall be back again next week. Good reading till then. <laughs>